speaker for this session is Mr. Mutlaq al Murayshid, who is the CEO of Tasnia. Uh, and I'd like to welcome him now to the stage. Much appreciated. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not known to be formal, so I'm not going to give all kinds of titles or anything. Being the last speaker, I think we saved the best for last, so I have to get myself a little bit. <laughs> uh, I will, uh, as usual, speak very frank with all of you here. Unfortunately, I'm not here to throw challenges at anybody. Be the best, be whatever, good environment and all that stuff. Unfortunately, I'm the poor guy in the block. I cannot be Aramco or Sabic or Mubadala or Adnak. I'm a guy actually who's trying to survive. Simple as that. So, uh, like Sheikh Mohammed yesterday said, he was told by a Sabic guy about steel and chemical. I'm going to borrow his line and I'm going to just talk about how to turn a company from a demise into stable, profitable, and hopefully soon expanding organization. It's not easy at all, and it's difficult when you come to a business that's basically bleeding cash, and you have debt, amount of debt, that for the bankers in this room or the financial people, when you have a net debt to EBITDA of over 12 multiple, you're really in trouble. So forget all the nice things, forget all the great visions and all that stuff. The basic reality of life is you need to cut that debt sooner than later and find a way to survive and turn the corporation around. And doing that is not pleasant. It's not a popularity contest. You will not be popular. You will be even hated. Your car will be damaged. My, car, my own car in the parking lot of the company was scratched a few times. But that's the price you have to pay. I was once married with a German. She was a tough cookie. And she's, yeah, she said, not like, look at me. I uh, raised Hamad, no maids, no servants. I ran one of the largest clinic in Wiesbaden, in Germany, which she owned by herself, and I wasn't there, and a year later she moved to Saudi Arabia, sold the clinic, blah, 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 all that stuff. And so that's for me was some challenge. When I look at that and see what in things, by the way, we are still friends, for those who know me or don't know me, um, Hamad's still friends, she's even, for the, especially the Gulf people who will not believe that, she's even a friend with my wife today. And she even takes Alia to Germany for summer. So it's a little bit strange. So uh, with that, let me say, turning around companies is, is, is not easy. It's not for a guy who wants to have an easy life. I left a job after many years. A friend of mine told me, but like maybe you're tired. I, first time I was a little pissed off. But then I said, maybe right. Let me see. It's time maybe to change. When you sit in a job, no matter what it is, for over 10 years, basically, you can do the job with your eyes closed. I'm not bragging about myself, but anybody in this room. Look yourself after 10 years in the same job, then it gets, it gets a little bit. So in my case, opportunity came. It's a job that I've done many times in Sabic and out of Sabic, turning around companies. I've never been an easy job in my life, from shared services to Hadid days to all kinds of stuff. So it was really an interesting for me. And I said, yes, I will prove to myself I still have the energy and maybe prove to my friend I can do it. So let me go over it. First of all, when you enter into a company that really serious and debt and close to going bankrupt, because you reach a point where you can't even meet your payroll because the cash is not there. You're not the subject of the world of Hadid or Aramco's of the world, where the parent company has deep pocket. You know you can do things, but they will give you money ultimately. They will not let you drown. But in our case, in Tasnia, unfortunately, we don't have that. We're totally public traded company, 100%, and nobody was giving us money. That's, that's the bottom line. So we basically had to streamline our operation, run the plants as efficient as we can, which is very important, 
cut our cost to the max, basically. As much as you can without shutting down your plants. Basically, increase your account payable tenor time and collect faster. That's one of the things we've done, and I have one of the best financial guys, in my opinion, in this neighborhood. So we have done that. And also, you have to look at your cash. Cash is king. In a situation like that, you have to reserve cash as much as you can. We reached a point at times where actually we delayed payment to some of our contractors, but we did not close the valve. There is a lot of chemical guys in this room, or refineries guys. We didn't close the valve, because if you close the money supply to your contractors, they need some cash to keep operating. But you can cut it a little bit, and you can sit with them. You, oh, I owe you 100 million. I'm going to pay you five this month, three next month, 10 the other month, and so on. And people will understand. So that's, that's very, very important. Then if you do all these things and still sinking, what do you do? You go back to your banks and say, look, guys, I love you. And I think you're partly guilty because with this huge amount of debt you gave the company, you're a part to blame in a way. So it's not only the company fault, but you're all part of it. So you guys going to extend the tenor. Of course, the banks in the beginning will not like it, but ultimately, the reality sinks in. It's better to increase the tenor and the company to pay interest. Otherwise, the bank will have to, I know some bankers in the room, the bank will put a non-performing loan in their books, and they're going to have to impair it and write it off. So they will never reach that. They will even actually give you money to pay them back the interest. So they don't go into this book business. So banks were OK. They're flexible. They got it. So we get a flexible structure. I will go over it in a while. And then you have to get the maturity, the covenants, everything has to be released. So now, we restructure the business. Unfortunately, I will show you some not pleasant numbers where you have to let one third of the workforce go. Believe me, that's not pleasant. I spend nights, sleepless nights. But it's better to pay the two thirds and be in the job than pay nobody. So you have to look which. You cut your arm to save your body, you reach that point. Unfortunately, you do that, and then <laughs> the problem is still, a ship is still going down. You're going to have to do something else. Then you come to look at your capital. Your capital is like your babies. And you say, well, babies, I love you all. But we're reaching a point, I'm going to let one of you go. So I love you, but I don't love you that much. So you, in our case, unfortunately, happen to be Crystal, we're going to let you go. But we still love you, so we're going to try to marry you, marry you with somebody. What are we going to do? An equity, cash, things, because we won't stay in that business. We still think it's a good business, but we need to deleverage. So we reached that point. We negotiated with Tronax of America. We're going to own 24%. We're going to get $1.673 billion in cash. We're going to bring, for the first time in a long time, direct FDI to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in the range of $3 billion, which is significant. Hasn't been done in a long time. For I know financial people can know these numbers. And we will own 24%. We will get two seats at the board, myself and one of our colleagues, in, in New York listed company. And that gives us a relief as ourselves. And also, we look at the rest of our portfolio, and with time, we're going to have to do a few things, adjustment here and there. And therefore, we really reduce our debt to equity. We reduce our net debt to EBITDA to get the corporation going. I know the time is short, so I'm not going to try to talk too much. So <clears throat> I said I talked to the head, you know, the head count reduction. You had to have packages. Imagine letting 3,000 people go in eight countries, different things, countries with unions. And by the way, let me leave a word of wisdom here. I hear a lot of people in Saudi especially talking about, oh, you cannot fire Saudis. You cannot do this. You cannot. Let me tell you, we have let go over 800 Saudis. I'm not bragging about it. That's not pleasant. But it has to be done, ladies and gentlemen. Business is business. We're not go see. We have to do that. But if those belief is bad in Saudi, they should go to France or Brazil. This even worse. The best you can do, of course, America, followed by Northern Europe, Australia, where we have operation, 
and therefore it can be done, and we've done it. We even have a demonstration in Yambu two, a year and a half ago uh, on us, and we managed to go through that. So I'm still here. I'm not in jail, huh? I'm still standing. Then you have to do what the reduction comes to shared services. We have the experience in shared services. We have the team who did it before. And, and we've done that basically to reduce the headcount and to control the corporation. Because fragmented corporation, people spending money is not good. So you need to control it from the center. And that's what happened. We also changed the company to an SBU structure where we have Pitkim, Titanium, and downstream. So people can manage it much easier. So this is, look at this for the financial people in the room. Look at the numbers where we have the oil coming and look at the things that we started in 2015 and beyond. We were really, boom, down. We have no choice over that. And then we start to improve. Basically, prices were not the best. Titanium in 15 and 16 was the, titanium dioxide was the worst. It came because of the cost cutting, because of the structure of the business. We closed non-profitable things. We let non-value-added work go out of the window. We have no choice over that. Then the debt structure is very creative. I think the banks in the beginning didn't like it, but ultimately they did. We called it 3 plus 1 plus 1. You give me three years for the debt extension, and if I pay you, almost a billion, you will give me another extension for a year. So last July, we paid about 500 plus million real, half a billion to the banks. We get to the year 20. We will pay some time next year, and we will get the debt extension to 21. So that's the trick of breathing. <sighs> because you can't, under a heavy load of debt of 12 to 1, a company cannot survive for long. So, you see it now in a different graph. We refinance the debt breakdown, the 5.6 that will come from the deal, hopefully by year end or early next year. We close the bending in our friends at the FTC in New York, and we're working with them. There are no guarantees, but we think we're making progress. And you see how the debt goes down in the corporation. And that's, you see, the pre-finance, refinance, and after. So that's just to give you a breathing space. The crystal divestiture goes, is basically, we reach a point that we have, as I said, we have to give one of the children away. So non-core for us at the time, highly leveraged. And we found our, one of the best world players. We're into chlorides technology, thronus and chlorides. We're feed the stock short, pigment or, you know, TIO too long. They feed the stock long, pigment short, Chlorides, so it's marriage made in heaven, like they say in America. So the two makes a great deal. We will stay, like I said, we will own part of it and get the cash also. And Tronox last year sold their soda ash business to finance this deal. So both parties are very excited about it. And then <clears throat> you, you do your things, you arrive. You, you know, your the portfolio optimization, which we are doing by diversion and focusing on, I'm trying to move fast because I got only two minutes. And then you create a world-class experience management in Tronox as combined entity. We will be owners, but not really operating it because it's a New York listed company. And our shareholders will benefit from the large corporation. It will be probably the world largest TI2 player. So that's very significant for us. This now giving you what the divestiture doing to our leverage. You see how our leverage improved to 3.6. It's for the financial people here, it's not pretty 3.6, but when you come from 12, it's great. So that's something, and of course, we will work on reducing it as we go. So if you look at what's happening in the FDI, I talked about it, we brought about 3 billion. You'll be the private sector debt in Saudi. It's quite significant. And by bringing money, we're actually putting liquidity in the banking sector. I know a lot of my friends bankers today they wouldn't want that because they already have some liquidity. They have over liquidity sometimes. But that's something we have to do. 
then the money will come to the kingdom in the form of the eye. It will reduce our debt significantly, and it will allow us ultimately to start giving dividend to our shareholders, because that's, that's, that's very important in, for any public listed companies. I talk about the capital structure optimization. You see how much debt we have versus the, you know, the whole capital structure, very significant debt on the balance sheet. And you see where the green line we have that you will bring, sorry, this slide move faster than I want. So the green line, you will see it bringing it, bringing it down here. That's, that's the line. I want to show you one classical graph used mostly in Western companies. This graph shows you the worst place you want to be, that pink side here, and where you like. I did not actually, I put mostly foreign companies for obvious reason. Unfortunately, we are in this part of the world a little bit defensive. I know I, we could put few in this corner, but we, we try not to. We just use Western European or you know, Asian companies. We came, unfortunately, from this to this. You ask maybe why. Fortunately, money came to the company. We should have deleveraged, paid some of the debt. It was invested. Fortunately, this investment did not bring EBITDA. And when you don't bring EBITDA, that's what happened to you. You come here, simple as that. So what happened next? What happened next is this. With all this work, you come from here, you move your way, unfortunately, down to the demise stage, and then you move. You move back up. This is the first half of this year, and God will, will be here, will be back. We have maybe lost a little bit of one of the babies, but that's a price to pay to save the mother, which has been done, and we bring it here. So that's, in a nutshell, what's happening when you really run a business that's, that's tough. It's always a pleasure and fun to be running a profitable and great business. My experience came from plenty, where you raise 30 billion from IPOs, bond, sukuk, bank debt, to a place where you actually have to divest and get some of your babies out in order to survive. That can really teach all of us a lesson, including myself, and to see that life is not easy, but it's rewarding. You come from a tough life, you really appreciate the value of life and things, and you know, in my case, even personal, you know, I was born, my father died when I was less than a week old in a Bedouin family, so you learn how to live a tough life. And when you do that, then you can manage. So there is silver lining in every dark cloud. It's always good to see what, what happens, how you can bring things. And this is a classic case of bringing things back to life. And it's pleasing. There's involved with a lot of people. I'm not alone in it. There is a whole team who did it. And one of the other advice I will leave if you run into that kind of situation for any lady or la female or male is make sure all your team with you. And if somebody not with you, get rid of them quickly, even if you don't have replacement. Because the damage of a senior people in a turnaround situation that who's not on board is going to cause you a hell of a lot of damage than running without that person. And we've done it, unfortunately, also. We have people who did not support direction. We let go. That's it. We, you know, we have no choice over that. So these are kind of in summary. I don't want to drag on you too long. I know it's zero time, so I'm going to try to just show you one last slide for those of us, you know Mr. Alfaris here, uh, CEO of Alinma Bank, that watch the stock market and sometime win Saudi Arabia, even educated people, say the Saudi stock market doesn't respond to company performance. Well, I can show you no, it does. This is the share price of the Dow. This is the situation of Tasnia, and this is the price of us in, in Tasnia. And you can see we moved here, we were going down. Then we done streamline operation here. 
then stocks still go down. Then we did the divestment, announced to the market, start to improve. Then we did the debt refinance. This is real data. This is not forecast, it's nothing. The historical real data. And this imposed on the date where these things were announced. So it's a fact. And here, and you can see the share price going back. So if you add it, in, the market actually is logical and knows better than all of us, <laughs> you know? And when they see the value creation, the market rewards you with a higher share price. Of course, the market, there is sometime incident happen in any market that drag the whole share price down. But the reality, the stock market does know where the value is and it rewards the people who create the value. So with that, I will uh, stop here and thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure. I hope I did a decent job of delivering a, not an easy and pleasant message, but a survival and bringing something from a demise, from what do you call it, the, you know, the mouth of the lion, back into safety. Thank you much. Appreciate it. And we'll be able to answer any questions. Thank you.